Uh, this is attempt two at this lecture. The last attempt didn't work, so let's hope this one works better. Uh, chapter 28, Reproductive System. And let's talk first about meiosis and gametogenesis. Now, I'm not, I've tried drawing on the screen the last time, but it screwed everything up. So I'm just going to kind of talk and hopefully point you guys around. Uh, gametogenesis is simply the either sperm or, spermatogenesis or oogenesis, and it's just the specialized ways way of saying meiosis. So meiosis, as we know from lab, has two divisions: meiosis one, which is the reduction division, and meiosis two which is kind of more of a mitosis-like division that keeps that haploid number. So you, in meiosis one, you're gonna go from diploid to haploid, you go from 46 to 23 chromosomes. And then in meiosis two, you maintain that chromosome number all the way through. Now, if you look over there on the uh, right side of this screen, excuse me, there is the difference between oogenesis and spermatogenesis. First thing you'll notice is that spermatogenesis produces four functional sperm cells while oogenesis only produces one functional oocyte. And this is, beyond, this is because of the whole uh, quality versus quantity strategy that females take. They want to make one large uh, egg, which they have to carry for nine months as an embryo and a fetus, and then they have to feed it, uh, So at least in mammals. So they have a lot more riding on this than uh, males do. Therefore, they, they tend to, uh, to build a much larger gamete, discarding the DNA and the leftovers from the from the meiotic divisions. Males don't need to do that because their sperm cells just have to get uh, to the target with uh, the uh, nuclear uh, warhead. So if you look down at the bottom of the screen, and I'm going to try this, here I go, trying it. Um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there's uh, fertilization taking place down here, right? Oh, yeah, of course it did that. Yeah, just like that. So it actually kind of worked. Um, but this fertilization event is what cues the second meiotic division. So if I look back at the full screen here and go, uh, this is meiosis one for both parties. This is meiosis two for males, but meiosis two for females doesn't take place until after sperm penetrates the egg. So once sperm penetrates the egg, you're going to have meiosis 2. So this is down there is meiosis 2 for the female. Uh, then those two nuclei uh, firm, uh, um, fuse and you get a, a zygote. So moving to the next slide, I hope. We see the female reproductive system. Uh, there's some fun facts there along the way. Uh, you have all, if you're a female, you have all of your primary oocytes by the time you're born. So you, you basically have all of the cells that will ever develop into eggs by the time you're born. Now you take time out until, you know, puberty kicks in and then you start pushing them through uh, meiosis one to make uh, secondary oocytes and then releasing those every 28 days or so. Uh, the follicle that ruptured to ovulate them uh, collapses into a massive tissue called a corpus luteum. And a corpus luteum produces a lot of progesterone and estrogen, which in turn maintain the endometrium. So if you get pregnant, the, the, the embryo has a place to interface with the mother. A few other structures here of note. Uh, the cervix is kind of a, like a, a pinch point, a bottleneck at the bottom of the uterus to keep the developing fetus inside. Uh, the vagina is often mistaken for the external genitalia. External genitalia on female, females is not the vagina. The vagina is inside and it is a copulatory organ that is, it is a, you know, it's for having sex. Uh, so that's where sperm are deposited. The external genitalia would be more correctly called the vulva and those include the labia and the uh, mons pubis and the clitoris, which as it turns out the clitoris is homologous to the penis of males. And mammary glands are unique to, to mammals. That's where we get our name. Uh, and that's because we've got, we've, we evolved a really neat way to feed our offspring by modifying some sweat glands and secreting it. It's kind of gross, but there you have it. All right, this screen looks a little confusing. It's not too bad though. I'll try to break it down for you. 
uh, you see several rows there and on the top row you see the uh, the status the state of the follicle and the oocyte then a couple of rows down you see the anterior pituitary and ovarian hormones and I'll follow those in a minute and then at the bottom you see the uterine cycle and that, that basically just represents the thickness of the uh, endometrium layer all right worked so let's start with the anterior pituitary and uh, ovarian hormone levels so after menstruation uh, you the you start the female starts producing more and more estrogen and at a certain critical mass here that's going to cause a spike in these two hormone levels that's luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone both of which are meant to mature this follicle and this uh, oocyte now those level the levels of these two guys luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone are encouraged by a hormone released by the hypothalamus called gonadotropin releasing hormone GnRH so GnRH the hypothalamus responds to the increasing estrogen levels by producing and releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone which causes FSH and LH to spike which causes the oocyte to be ovulated all right now we coming down off of that we're going to have a, the endometrium getting thicker and thicker and thicker, right? That's because of the estrogen levels and progesterone levels. Whoa. Whoa. The estrogen and progesterone levels uh, spiking again due to the existence of this corpus luteum up here. So the corpus luteum starts to produce these guys again, which causes this endometrium to get thicker and thicker and thicker. And if there's a pregnancy, that means that the embryo is going to implant somewhere over here happily. If not, uh, you this corpus luteum degrades, stops producing estrogen and progesterone, and you're going to have menstruation. Uh, interestingly, if there is a fertilization event, you're going to have that embryo over here in this text bit. I hope so that's going to make it bigger. Great. Great. Love this. Science. Technology is awesome. All right. The embryo is going to produce something called human chorionic gonadotropin, which, uh, in addition to mimicking the effects of estrogen and progesterone, tend to maintain the estrogen and progesterone levels and thus maintain this endometrial layer uh, throughout pregnancy. Moving on to the male reproductive system, uh, we see it kind of disassembled over there. There are the primary sex organs, which are the testes which produce the sperm cells. Those sperm cells mature in the epididymis. I guess it would be epididymi if it was plural, right? So there they are. They mature there, they get, mo they get motile there, they get their ability to swim. And then during ejaculation, they're gonna like shoot up these duct, these vas, vasa deferentia is the way I wanna call it, but vas, vas deferens or ductus deferens. Those are smooth, they have smooth muscle lining the walls and they're gonna kind of pump those sperm cells up and around here where they're going to start getting contributions from one, two, three uh, glands. The seminal vesicles provide the majority of this, um, the, the volume of ejaculate and some sugar for the sperm cells and some uh, a basic solution to counter the acidity of the female's reproductive system. Prostate glands, pro prostate gland produces a few more things including some antibiotics. Uh, and the bulbourethral glands produce um, a clear lubricating uh, mucus that act, uh, will will start seeping out even before ejaculation. The urethra, which just like in females, leaves the bladder and is a urinary uh, structure, combines with the vasa deferentia here in males. So males have a common urogenital opening in in the urethra, whereas females have uh, two separate. Uh, urogenital openings or a urinary and a, and a reproductive opening. The, uh, the urethra travels down the penis which is the male version of a copulatory organ. It, uh, they, it's kind of lock and key with the vagina so it's where it's, it's how internal fertilization takes place. Um, if you're going to have internal fertilization you need a method to get the gametes inside of the female's reproductive system usually. 
and that's why lots of animals have a penis. If you think about how fish do it, they just kind of spray their eggs and sperm out into the water column and they meet up outside the body. The semen, that's what the fluid's called, that's produced is about three to five mils in volume, which isn't that much, and but it does contain up to half a billion sperm cells. So uh, I guess theoretically one male could fertilize the eggs of one fourteenth of the world population or something like that. So uh, pretty crazy. This last slide shows embryonic development uh, kind of uh, through both sexes. So if you look over, let me see if the pen's working, it is. So if you look over here, this is what you'd call a sexually indifferent uh, stage of your embryonic development where you can literally go either way. Uh, the, the chromosomes that you have will direct the development either into sort of the classic male or classic female phenotype. If you have a Y chromosome, there's something called a sex determining region, which is going to cause you to start producing testosterone and cause the genitalia to, to develop to the left here. Whereas without the testosterone, you develop sort of the default to the right as a female phenotype. Now, you'll see that there's a few structures there that I've listed as homologous. So the ovaries and testes come from the exact same tissue in the embryo. The, uh, the penis and the clitoris, likewise. The labia majora and the scrotum are derived from the same, same embryonic tissue. So males and females, you know, they look different, you know, but uh, they're not that different. They're just, they just got shaped different from, uh, from the effects of hormones and, and genes. Uh, puberty is a time when you start uh, becoming an adult and you have to you start producing sperm cells uh, and you start pushing those primary oocytes to become secondary oocytes where you'll start ovulating them. The you, adulthood lasts the rest of your life, but as you get older and older, you're going to have a general decline in some functions. Uh, menopause is in females and what they call climacteric in males, it's menopause, but it's kind of a more gradual decline in testosterone and production and sperm count. Uh, females have a more of an abrupt cessation, and it may seem unfair, but it's really got a good evolutionary reason. Uh, without before there were ever hospitals and doctors and sanitary you know conditions, uh, childbirth is an incredibly dangerous time, right, for both the, the mother and the the uh, offspring. But as you get older and older, it gets even more dangerous. So you're much more likely to die during childbirth as an older mother, especially without proper uh, medical care. So the onset of, of menopause is basically a lifesaver for the female who you could expect has already produced offspring. So maybe some sort of hypothetical ancestor of ours had, uh, you know, a female had, uh, you know, a number of offspring, and then she gets to a point in her life where it's getting more dangerous to reproduce. If she stops being able to reproduce, she can live for much longer and give care to both her offspring and her offspring's 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 offspring and relatives. So that's, that's helping organisms that are related to you that have your genes, which is uh, basically what having offspring bring des in the first place. It's producing organisms that have your genes. Uh, that's that's it. That's kind of a truncated chapter, but <clears throat> uh, the, the study these uh, PowerPoints here and listen to the words that were coming out of my mouth. I encourage you to pause and take notes uh, extensively over things that I didn't manage to type down but did manage to talk about. Okay, thank you. Signing off.